<clears throat> well, good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, first of all, I ask everyone present to turn electrical devices to silent or turn them off if they're likely to interfere with the sound system. Um, for our witnesses, the uh, sound desk will operate the speaker, so no need to press any buttons when we come to your evidence. I have apologies from Andy Whiteman, who is on other parliamentary business, and also apologies from John Mason, Dean Lockhart. They will be arriving during the session and give their apologies for their lateness. Item one is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed to do so? Thank you. Now, our two witnesses for the first panel today are Dr. Stuart McIntyre of the Fraser of Allender Institute and Professor David Bell of the University of Stirling. So welcome to both of you. Uh, thank you for coming in to our economic data inquiry to give evidence, um, simply to remind members to keep questions uh, short, sharp, and focused, and also perhaps our witnesses the, in their answers the same. And witnesses, no doubt, understand that they, they don't have to answer every question, but uh, obviously if they feel they have something to contribute to the discussion, then please do so, and simply indicate by raising your hand if you wish to come in. So I'll start with um, a general question myself. And uh, last week we had a number of witnesses before the committee, and in particular a witness from the Club of Rome urged the committee to consider what we are measuring and why we measure it. So my first question to our two witnesses today is, are we collecting the right data? And do we understand the purpose as to why we're collecting it and the reasons for doing so and the purposes to which it can be and should be put? So perhaps I'll start with um, Professor Bell. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Um, I'll just make a couple of points on this. Um, I think it's important uh, to collect data for a couple of reasons. The first, uh, you should be thinking about, well, if I had this information, would I change some key decision, some policy decision that, uh, that hinges on the knowledge or lack of knowledge of this piece of data? So that's a sort of utilitarian approach, a sort of cost-benefit approach. Um, uh, and, and you have to bear in mind that collecting data, and I may expand on this later, is an expensive process. The second uh, argument that I would put is that, is that there is a wider perspective on data that, um, you know, a lot of democratic um, uh, decision-making institutions rely on a well-informed public as well as a well-informed set of policy makers. So there is a strong case for having uh, uh, a general basis of, uh, of information which, uh, which most Western democracies have, and it's necessary to allow for public debate uh, and, and discussion around evidence rather than uh, around a lack of knowledge. So there's sort of um, immediate approach, well, what information do I need to, to make decisions about policy? And then this more general approach, what is it that we need, what kind of information do we need to, to be able to conduct a, a coherent uh, democratic debate? And, and do you feel that in Scotland we are collecting the information and data that we need to approach matters as you've suggested we need to? Well, uh, we're not too badly served. Uh, uh, it seems to me there are areas where, where uh, information isn't that great. And there are also problems that the nature of information is changing. So um, relying on what has happened in the past and the ways of collecting data from the past um, are not necessarily going to uh, uh, last through the long term. So for example, I, I understand you'll have had um, 
a discussion of the, for example, the shrinking sample size in the labour force survey. And uh, this, this sort of uh, uh, difficulty of collecting data, either from households or from businesses, is, is, is becoming more and more difficult, partly because um, individuals' um, time is more and more precious to them, partly because um, they see it more as an infringement on their... Um, uh, uh, well, they're, bomb they're being constantly being bombarded with requests for information. Why should they treat uh, a request from, for information from the government different from one from Tesco or different what, from one from Facebook? So there are, there are multiple um, pressures on, on people to provide data and they become more and more selective and, and that actually is a problem in terms of uh, uh, in, encouraging people to uh, provide data. Now, a small sample, a smaller sample size, may be uh, not that much of a problem, but it could be. It, it, it could be because it might, if you want to disaggregate your data uh, 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 extensively, it does become a problem. And secondly it may lead to biases in your data. So you really, really want that if you have the labour force survey that you are getting an accurate estimate, say, of the unemployment rate. Uh, and if uh, people are selectively not responding to surveys, for example, young men who are often out when, uh, when uh, interviewers knock on doors are less likely to respond to uh, to survey, so you might have a job getting a good estimate of youth unemployment simply as a result of that process, and all of these things have to be taken into account. Um, right, thank, thank you. Um, perhaps Dr. Stuart McIntyre, a few thoughts uh, on that? Just to, I guess, pick up a couple of points David just made there, I, I think there's a distinction between high level data, um, which is internationally comparable, which is frankly all a lot of people want to talk about or measure or consider. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there's a good coverage, I think, within Scotland of those key indicators subject to um, some of the, the concerns about sample sizes and other things. But I, I think there's a second stage to this, which is thinking about programme and policy specific data. And rather than focusing on um, if you like management information about how well the programme's working, in terms of you know, consumer feedback, if you like, from people in the programme, thinking more about um, how we can capture the data we need at the point at which we're designing policy so that we can properly evaluate it. And I think this is um, the area that gets a lot less attention. And economists have a kind of toolkit of, of, of methods that let us um, evaluate programmes in certain cases, even when that hasn't been thought about. But I think capturing that data within the programme that allows it to be evaluated is something which um, complements the, the higher level stats. But at the moment, there's, I think, a big focus on, um, we've, we've brought this policy in, what does it do to GDP? And the reality is the transmission mechanisms are so varied between that intervention and GDP that actually trying to track down the contribution of a particular policy to GDP is quite difficult. Um, and so I think... Inevitably, we have to have that higher level data because we have to do things which are uh, produce data which are internationally compatible. But I do think there's a second stage which um, more attention needs to be given to, which is actually capturing the data we need in designing programmes to properly evaluate them. Um, and, and to pick up just briefly on David's point about um, sample sizes, absolutely, and, and you know this is a big issue with the Labour Force survey. Um, it's one of the reasons why there's been a move towards using more administrative data to try to get round some of the problems of, of, of poor response rates to surveys. So I think there's definitely a move in that direction. Um, more probably could be done and should be done, and to be honest, is being done. Um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're um, at the early stages of, of fully utilising some of the administrative data we have. 
Thank you. And I, I think uh, Richard Leonard has some questions that may relate back into what um, David Bell was talking about. So hand over to Yeah, Richard you have Leonard. begun to address this already, um, but it's really just to ask you, for our benefit, what you consider to be the strengths and weaknesses of the current suite of statistics uh, on the economy that we collect for Scotland. Uh, and secondly, uh, from your vantage point as people who work with this data um, day in, day out, uh, are there any sp specific improvements that you would recommend uh, were made? Um, OK. Um, so it, it seems to me that, you know, for example, the trade data is, is pretty difficult uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, there is a question of why you need the trade data, which, which is an open question, but, 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 but clearly for the, in relation to the question of democratic debate rather than the question of, well, we're going to take a, you know, a, a new policy direction, there probably is a case for enhancing the, the trade data. There's also, um, I mean, it, it seems to me on, for example, income data, uh, an interesting uh, um, issue. And this is, I, I was quite surprised looking at the papers for this morning. There was no mention of inequality or, or distributional aspects of, uh, of the economy. So I take it that inequality is one of the issues that that, that um, may be of uh, considerable interest, to, certainly to this committee. And, and if you're trying to compare the um, incomes of the rich relative to the incomes of the poor, you have to have um, enough data in what I would call the tails of the distribution, the very high uh, levels of income or the very low levels of income. And that, that uh, creates uh, you know, an, a necessity around the overall size of the, of the data that, that you collect. Now, HMRC have got data, and this is uh, Stuart's point about administrative data on incomes, um, which, um, it, well, there are issues around uh, accessing it um, fully, uh, but those kinds of data uh, you know, are, are some having more access to these data, I think, would be of interest. And of course, we're moving into a situation where Scotland has control over income tax. So actually, it's not just a general interest question. <laughs> this it's of particular interest to uh, uh, to the um, to the Scottish government. Another thing, uh, again, picking up on on. Stuart's point, but and making a point that perhaps hasn't been made to the committee. If you are looking to evaluate policy uh, where you think that the outcome of that policy actually may take some time to come through, then there are great benefits in on having what, what are called longitudinal data, where you measure businesses or households or individuals at a point in time, follow up later, follow up later again, and so on. And in relation to that, for example, I would commend the Scottish Government's uh, Growing Up in Scotland survey, which started in around 2000 and followed children born in that year. Now, if you're looking to find out what, what, are the, what is the effectiveness of early years intervention policies, then if you have uh, uh, information about uh, children and their parents uh, at a very early stage in their life, you know what they've been uh, exposed to in terms of uh, early years interventions. And then you follow them up into their 20s. Then you can track back to see if those early interventions had the desired effect or did not have the desired effect. These kinds of studies are called longitudinal studies. There are, the UK is the best country in the world for longitudinal studies, but there are, uh, you know, there are opportunities. Unfortunately, they're very expensive because you, you have this continuing uh, uh, follow-up. Um, so that's only a couple of examples that I've given you, but I think, I th I think they're, they're, they're quite relevant. 
just pick up, I guess, a few points. Um, I mean, I agree with David um, with respect to the trade data. Um, I think one of the things with, with the trade data is we've got three different um, three different measures that get at trade. Um, the Index Manufacturers Exports, Export Statistics Scotland, um, and the HMRC data. Um, and they all tell us slightly different things. But probably the best among them is the Export Stat Scotland data. Now, one of the, the challenges for that, if you... Um, if you look at the, the documentation the Scottish Government put out, is, is response rates of firms. Firms aren't required to complete that, and as a result, um, the sample sizes aren't as, as comprehensive as it could be. Um, and there's an issue around maybe particular types of firms tend not to answer them, larger firms or, or, or wherever. Um, and so I think one of the things that we outlined in, in, in the submission that we made to, to the committee was that moving towards a situation where the Scottish Government can compel firms to complete this information on the same basis as ONS have that power just now would seem infinitely sensible. Um, and maybe one way of broadening the coverage of that um, and uh, you know, improving the sample size at the same time and the quality of the data. Um, so just, that was just kind of one point on that. I think it's, it's one of the things that's quite important to, to, to recognise, I think, is that Scotland's very well served, actually, um, with economic data, um, both in terms of quality but also timeliness relative to other parts of the UK. Um, we get GDP data roughly 100 and well, for the first time this year we had it in less than 100 days after the end of the quarter, but you know, typically 110, 115 days. Um, we won't find out until December this year what happened to the North East economy in 2016. So the, the, relative to other parts of the UK, we're actually pretty well served in terms of timely quality indicators. Um, I think there are things that I know the Scottish Government are looking at which I think will drive improvements in some of those, those statistics. Um, the Scottish Government are now getting, I think, better uh, access to things like the monthly business survey, um, which they use to, to produce the index of manufactured exports, which may have spillover effects for, um, for GDP data, for instance. Um, but I think there is a programme of, of, of continuous improvement both on the ONS side and also on the Scottish Government side to try and produce better quality, more timely data. Um, so I think it's, it's worth kind of stressing that. Um, I guess just as from a kind of academic perspective, one of the things that I would say is that um, when we're thinking about some of these headline indicators, one of the things we need is a long enough consistent time series. Um, if you're trying to, for instance, forecast GVA or um, indeed um, uh, any, you know, most other macroeconomic indicators, you need a long enough time series to estimate that model on. So if we are um, investing in new, new data series then, or changing existing data series, something we have to consider is just the compatibility of that both over time and also relative to other parts of the UK. I mean, there are those still time lags, aren't they? In, for example, productivity data and sub-regional productivity yep. data, business uh, research and development data, there is quite a lag in some of these things. And in, a, in an era where we are facing shocks, whether it's the oil price shock or the possibility of the effects of Brexit um, and the new uh, powers that the Scottish Parliament has got, it seems to me uh, timeliness is actually extremely important. So I, I wonder whether you'd... you'd, you'd comment on that. The, the other thing was, which I thought was extremely helpful in the, um, in the submission that uh, Stuart McIntyre made, uh, was what you were saying about um, capital flows, uh, inflows and outflows, and um, uh, the extent to which uh, foreign direct investment data is robust or not, because um, the Scottish Government um, talk a lot uh, in their um, um, reckoning of how well the Scottish economy is doing uh, around the E and Y attractiveness survey and so on and so forth. And yeah. I just wonder whether you've got any views about uh, how robust and how reliable and how comprehensive a picture uh, that that paints. And I also note that you said on capital investment, um, uh, Dr. McIntyre, there is little in the way of data on investment for Scotland, either in the aggregate or by the sector. Now, again, it seems to me that that's that's, that's a fairly important piece of information upon which to understand what's happening to innovation, what's happening to investment, and what the kind of long-term prospects for the economy are going to be. Uh, so I wonder whether maybe Dr McIntyre yeah. first and, and Professor Bell second want to comment on those two aspects. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, you're right. It is one of the the, the kind of obvious um, things that's that's missing from from the landscape is a better understanding of um, of investment and in particular FDI. Um, I won't comment too much on on the Ernest Young attractiveness data um, because I don't frankly know how they put that together. Um, but what I would say is that probably the, the takeaway that everyone takes from that is Scotland is the number one destination for FDI within the UK, um, which is fine based on the number of projects. If you look at the number of jobs, actually we're not. Um, and so one of it's a good illustration of reading beyond the headlines sometimes really important. Um, if you look at the number of job support by FDI projects in Scotland, it's not as much as it is elsewhere. We don't rank as highly. But in terms of number of projects, we do. Um, so, you know, if you take the same project, divide it in two, well, you can see how that system can quite easily be gamed. Um, so, I'll, I'll, I won't comment much more on that, but I think you've identified what is a very obvious um, gap in the landscape. The only other thing is, I mean, I mean, it is costly for businesses to supply data, and quite a lot of the delays are are based around uh, legal um, requirements for them to submit data. Uh, and if you think, for example, even of self-employment uh, and those people who don't aren't, aren't under the PAYE system, they actually um, have a, around um, 15 months after the end of the tax year before they actually have to submit their last cash payment for income tax. And while that persists, you're going to just have to estimate self-employment uh, income over that uh, over that period of time. So I think a lot of it, uh, of, of, there's a question about how, the, um, kind of matching up the cost in terms of lost opportunities to make decisions because data aren't timely against the cost to businesses of, of making that data available uh, more quickly. And I, I, I think HMRC are in the process of, of trying to get uh, individuals to more or less uh, continuously supply data on, on income and, and obviously with, with information, sorry, with uh, IT systems now, it, it may be more easy to do that. It may not be necessary to continue with the 15 month delay, um, which is, you know, may have been uh, all right for, for uh, a time when, when IT systems weren't so, uh, weren't so uh, sophisticated. So uh, th there's just that that issue about one, how important is it to get the data absolutely, uh, you know, at the end of the relevant quarter. Can, can I just ask one very quick, uh, very, br very briefly, and last then question. a follow-up yeah. from Gil Patterson. Yeah. Go going back to what you said about trade flows, you didn't mention um, input-output tables. I mean, are, do, do you see those as being an important uh, measure of? Uh, uh, trade, uh, intra-regional trade and trade between Scotland and other parts of, uh, of the world? Well, I, mean, I, I guess, the, as I said earlier, it's three main indicators through which we get the data. Um, what the Scottish Government statisticians then do is, um, is balance pr principally with the export stats Scotland data with the supply and use tables in the national accounts. Um, and so um, the IO tables, if you like, provide us with a really nice sexual coverage, which is richer in sexual detail than Export Stat Scotland, but it is the output of the use of you know, various different sources rather than, you know, so if you pick up Export Stat Scotland, it will not perfectly align with, um, with, the, with the IO data, um, but the IO data will give you a much richer sexual picture um, and is constrained and balances with um, the rest of the economy. Um, Whereas, as we understand, the Export Stats Scotland is a survey of certain, certain firms in certain sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, follow yeah, up from yeah, Gil so Patterson. There's a lot of talk about uh, exports, certainly questions in relation to that. But putting my business hat on that, uh, looking at a competitive, particularly with Brexit, we don't have uh, very much information on uh, imports and in a business sense and of course we're, we're agencies who, who, who are charged with in, improving the Scottish economy have to make decisions who they're going to support 
And you would think that if we would need that information on imports because, you know, in a business sense, it might be the easiest shift for a business to do to replace the imports uh, in an, you know, within uh, Scotland itself. And yet, it, it, we're, we're so light. So how do we overcome that? Where do we go and how do we... How to do it to, to get these numbers? Uh, I'll just make a couple of points. I, th I think the vast majority of imports into Scotland will originate in the rest of the UK and will either come from the rest of the UK or have been channeled through the rest of the UK from some foreign, foreign destination. So it might be quite difficult uh, to track those. Another uh, thing... My second point is that um, a lot of um, international trade now works around complex supply chains where goods uh, cross borders possibly multiple times. Uh, um, I heard, uh, I think last week, a, a discussion around the car industry and some components crossing out of and into the UK 42 times. Now, if, um, goods are moving back and forth across the border, in this case the Scottish border, a lot of time it, times it becomes quite difficult to know exactly how to, uh, how to track these. So I, I'm just saying um, there will be a set of imports that will be re relatively easy to identify, but there will be a lot of, for some businesses trying to uh, identify what goods or what components of goods are imported and where there is domestic value added will be quite difficult. I, I mean, I guess I'd pick up a couple of things on that. One is, and, and this picks up on, on Richard's point as well, actually, while maybe not as, as, um, as timely as, as some other measures of trade, actually the information in, um, in the, the national accounts about kind of income, uh, sorry, import flows is, you know, it, it's not as detailed as we'd like, it's not as timely as we like, but it is there. Um, and if we think about what the alternative routes to try and gather that data might be, um, then, okay, Brexit and requirements around rules of origin might help with the administrative data around that. Um, but if you look at, as, as David said, where most of Scotland's imports come from, it's here, the rest of the UK, um, and we've got a huge issue about trying to estimate those flows, um, or it's potentially the rest of the EU. Um, and the HMRC data um, on imports doesn't actually do a great job of, of capturing that either. Um, I guess one thing I, I, just to note is that um, some colleagues as part of, I know Rebecca Riley was here from the National Institute last week, um, one of the projects under the ONS's new Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence, um, led by um, one of my colleagues, um, or the work plans led by her, um, is, is trying to use innovative data sets to try and understand the flow of interregional trade within the UK. So things like looking at financial transactions to try and help us better understand the flow of goods and services within the UK. But it's incredibly complex to try and back that out. Can, can I just, just, uh, just uh, agree with you? I, I've got personal experience that the amount of trade that lands in England held in warehouse and then shipped out. I understand that. But the importance of that, particularly you have the economic, I mean, really the economy committee, and it must be so important to the Scottish economy, economy to understand that, that question. But the other thing is that we're all politicians and there's a great debate and we don't have, you know, we can't provide the population with the answers to quite fairly straightforward seemingly questions in relation to to imports and exports. These are well, quite fundamental. So it, my question is, are they not worth investing in so that we can square that circle? Well, um, I, I, I mean, I agree that, that, that it is a very important part of the political debate. It, it's just a question of the cost of, of collecting all that information at the level of detail that would be necessary to give us accurate estimates. Uh, that 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 um, the public could have uh, reliance on. And I think Jamie Halcorn Johnson has a question that may um, lead on from that. 
Yeah, well, uh, thank you, for con convener. Um, I was going to ask actually about the kind of key gaps um, uh, in coverage in Scotland, but obviously that's been um, touched on quite a lot. And so, uh, and you mentioned obviously, um, I think uh, Dr. McIntyre mentioned the northeast as on the regional side. Um, so, looking at the uh, the kind of a regional and local perspective, where the kind of key, key gaps are, uh, and you know what we can do to to fill those gaps in terms of Local, local and regional data. If I can just pick up one of the things that I didn't um, didn't touch on earlier in, in response to Richard talking about gaps in data was one of the fairly obvious gaps in data which the ONS, to be fair to them, have recognised themselves is is around prices and regional price data. Um, so there is some work ongoing just now um, with the Scottish Government and and ONS and partly funded by HMRC and partly funded by the Scottish Government to improve um, the, the sample coverage of the Living Cost and Food Survey, which produces the weights for the price indices so that we've got a more re uh, Scottish index. So um, that's still a gap, but there is something being done in that. Yeah. Um, I meant to mention that earlier. Um, I think one of the difficulties is, and I, I read through um, the various submissions to the inquiry, including North Ayrshire Council had submitted something and, and various other people had, had mentioned localisation of data. I think uh, there's a difficulty in some of these high level indicators. You know, think about things like um, GNI or um, investment or um, you know, some of these other um, kind of headline indicators, where the more localised you become, the easier it is to identify fluctuations with particular firms. Um, and I know one of the things that ONS are, are really concerned about is um, the extent to which you can basically identify people and activities from producing more localised data, which is one of the reasons why they you know, maybe censor local data. So I think th there's a trade-off here. Um, one of the things that I think ONS do, um, which is good and the Scottish Government um, may, may want to think about, is the ONS, when they produce their GVA data, even though it's not anywhere near as timely as the Scottish Government data, do break this down to nuts two, nuts three. Um, so going from Scotland down to um, the nuts two regions and the nuts three regions, so you get a lot more spatial granularity mm -hmm. in those data, which we don't have, say, with the Scottish data, but the Scottish data are quarterly, whereas the ONS data are, are annual. So I think there is more that can be done to split these out. And I think it is, for the reasons we identified um, in the submission, quite important. Mm -hmm. Could I just pick up three points in relation to that. Uh, first, Stuart's point on, on uh, anonymisation. It is something that um, uh, occupies my mind uh, quite a lot because I've just been doing a, uh, a fairly large-scale survey on Scotland's ageing population. And um, in the course of that, I've had to go through, I think, three different separate courses or pass three different courses on anonymisation, which is basically making sure that I never present data in a way whereby an individual or a household can be specifically identified and um, I won't go into the complexity of that but but it is something that the suppliers of data are very concerned about because the last thing that they want as suppliers of data is that some firm or some individual finds that they have been identified and some information on them has been released uh, which they don't want to have uh, have released in relation to um, prices to, again, another point of Stuart's, uh, it is important. One particular area in relation to prices that I think is very important is housing costs. Housing costs in general, we don't really have good data on that. And that is um, particularly important. It's actually particularly important for differences between the generations, because at the moment, uh, the um, uh, disposable, the net income of pensioner families is above that of working age families. And the reason for it is that housing costs for pensioner families are much, much lower than those for, um, for uh, working age families. So, and, and it's really that that makes the difference. So in terms of one element of prices that I think is very important, housing costs uh, would be one of them. 
Lastly, in relation to geographical data, um, there is, I, I, I mean, we tend to think of um, the way that economies operate in relation to markets rather than constituencies. Uh, so, uh, you know, what is the appropriate way to think of the labour market in the northeast? Clearly, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City interact very strongly. So, it might not make much sense to consider them separately. I mean, clearly, there are cases, there are arguments why you would want to look at very detailed data, and you can with, for example, DWP data on benefits. Uh, but, but again, it, it's a little bit of a caution. If you're wanting to use uh, geographically uh, granularized data, uh, you have to be careful about which indicators it is that you're thinking about and whether they make sense for that for that granularity. Okay. Can I just come back slightly? Just just on that. Um, uh, I mean, I'm a uh, MSP that represents the Highlands and Islands. Obviously, we've got Highlands and Islands Enterprise coming in um, yeah. uh, next, and so one of the questions I wanted to put to them is how they use the information they do have. Uh, uh, they we are they are able to collect now. Uh, I, I suppose it then moves on to what information is there that is collected, whether it's by um, different organisations or local authorities or other bodies that perhaps isn't feeding into the national. Uh, the, the ONS collection at the moment. Is there quite a lot of, I wouldn't necessarily call it lost data, but data that isn't uh, part of the part of the kind of wider uh, wider process? So, I mean, if you're talking about the whole spectrum of data, mm -hmm. um, aside from <coughs> business and, um, and economy data, what I've just mentioned, the DWP data, mm -hmm. is probably that which is most granularised. Um, uh, covers benefits, pensions, um, and, uh, and so on. There, there's data on, then that's held at the local authority level. Um, uh, that tends to be education data, care data, uh, and, and some, some data associated with property, probably. Um, and other than that, other than exploring, you know, novel ways of, of, of addressing data, like use, using Google searches, uh, I'm not, in, not sure that there are many other existing data sets that, that you can interrogate. Obviously, the census, but of course, it's historic. And it's quite expensive. The 2011 census cost £65 million. Pounds. Uh, uh, the uh, National Records of Scotland does try to update it in terms of births, marriages and deaths in local areas, but it's never completely accurate and we'll get the next shot at this in 2021. Um, I very briefly, just, I mean, as I, I noted earlier, the ONS do produce more localised GVA data, although not um, as timely as we'd like, and the most recent we have at the moment is 2015. Um, out of the APS data, the annual population survey, we do get localised um, information on the labour market. Um, so I feel like that's kind of high level. Um, there are other surveys that, that take place more regionally, which I would expect would feed into more localised decision making. Um, I, I guess a I, I kind of final point in this is as we move towards better using administrative data, there are opportunities to tie activity more closely to um, localities, mm. subject to acknowledging that a business that's reporting in one area may have enterprises spread across, and thus we get into issues around how do we apportion their turnover or their employment or whatever across um, Scotland or indeed the UK. So um, I, there are opportunities, but also still challenges with using the admin data. Thank you. Thank you. And now a question from Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, we've been talking this morning and previous weeks about the, the gaps in economic data. And given that the ONS is the UK's National Statistics Institute, are they doing enough to fill those gaps and address those issues? Um, on. <laughs> um, so, should I declare an interest as part of the ONS's Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence project? Um, perhaps. Um, 
I think if, if you look back at, at Charlie Bean's review, um, which came out in 2016, um, I think that pushed ONS to, to up their game in a number of key areas. Um, so, you know, we are now seeing um, a development of, and I'm involved in some of this, um, moving ONS's regional GVA to be much more timely. They are working one part of it, we are working another, but the aim is to try and improve the coverage of ONS's um, regional GVA data, make it more timely, um, complement what the Scottish Government are doing. Um, so I think there are examples there. Um, there are also examples where the Scottish Government, HMRC, as I said earlier, are working to boost the, um, the survey coverage of the living cost and food survey so that we can start getting more of a regionalised price index um, for Scotland, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, in a sense, um, ONS are illustrating a willingness to listen to people. Um, and indeed, one of the, the things that came out of the Charlie Bean's review that um, they're really being challenged on is engaging with users and responding to user needs. The Scottish Government have the same responsibility and, and um, I think do a good job on that. Um, so part of the, bo the, the onus, I think, is on, is on us as users um, and also um, on the devolved administrations and the devolved um, parliaments to, to, to put a bit of pressure on ONS if, if we think there's something they should be doing or not. Um, but I think, particularly since the, the Bean Review, there's been a, a real change in, in approach from ONS, which is quite positive. But, you know, we are talking about an organisation that um, carries out eight, 80 different surveys, issues 1.7 million questionnaires to over 290,000 businesses. So the data must be there to a certain extent. And is it, is it just the case? I mean, a quick Google of ONS will pl find plenty of reports from ONS on England and Wales data only. But if you try and find a similar Scotland only report, you'll find it very difficult. And one quick point on that, I, mean, I think ONS produced something like 20% of national statistics. So mm -hmm. ONS are not the dominant producer of no. national statistics. Um, so you know, they do a lot. Um, and I think increasingly, as the Scottish Government are getting access to um, the HMRC data, um, which they've already had some access to, mm -hmm. um, looking at evaluations of LBTT, for instance, um, and also um, the, the, the work that I was saying has, has been going on around um, access to the monthly business surveys, I think that treasure trove, if you like, of, of ONS data is being made available. Um, there was an issue, I think, where it wasn't clear access protocols, it wasn't clear the legality of that, that's now been cleared with the, with the Digital Economy Act. So I guess th the question now is, do we see um, an opening up of that treasure trove of data or not? Just make a couple of points. Um, so um, one thing which I'm, I guess, critical of the ONS is, is in relation to its presentation of data. It's actually, I find, quite difficult to go onto the ONS website and find whatever it is that I want. And I think, for example, OECD and Eurostat uh, give you much more opportunity to uh, interrogate quite big databases and, and, and construct your own tables yeah. without too much difficulty. Um, they're trying to get, um, um, maybe improve their, the ways that they visualize data and, and often and there have been great advances in data visualization in the last three or four years and actually I would say that SPICE is ahead of them in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the reports that SPICE regularly uh, uh, puts out. As Stuart said, um, the um, uh, ONS is not a monopoly provider of, of, of statistics in, in, in the UK. The ESRC, which I used to um, be on one of the panels of, uh, does a very good job in terms of, of producing other uh, data sets. Uh, and here I will, since Stuart has plugged himself, I will plug myself. Um, one of the things rather puzzlingly which the um, was uh, funded by UK-based departments, uh, namely DWP and HM Treasury, was the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing, which is a study restricted to England mm. uh, specifically. And uh, I've been trying for some years and now, I think, have succeeded in, in producing uh, uh, an equivalent survey for Scotland, which we're going to release in December. 
uh, that is that that's really uh, been a struggle. But I'm, I'm, I don't, in general, find a consistent bias towards England and Wales. Um, although, uh, you know, it, it is true that quite a lot of data are England and Wales specific. Yeah. Sometimes that's due to the way that the, the administrations are working either together or differently. Given the, given the gaps that we've got, is there any areas that ONS could improve and help assist? I mean, it, it, clearly going back to the, the price data, which in turn is because you have to have a, a basket. If you're, if you're going to have a price index, you're going to have to have a basket. Therefore, you need expenditure surveys, and there, um, and this is important now for for VAT in particular. There is clearly a need to do more in in relation to understanding how Scottish households spend their money. I mean, just to follow that up, that is now in train. Um, with the 100% boosted survey of the living costs and food in Scotland, which is paid for jointly, I think, by HMRC and um, Scottish Government, um, for precisely the reason David identified, which is the VAT um, issue. Then, and just my final point is, um, Richard Marsh, in his written evidence, said staff, this is ONS staff, are overwhelmingly focused on simply getting the statistics out. Relatively little attention is devoted to how the quality and relevance of the statistics or their delivery could be improved. So, given those concerns, you know, should Scotland have its own statistics authority, similar to the ONS, given that Northern Ireland has it, and Scotland, Scottish government is already having to supplement uh, a lot of the surveys that are carried out anyway to get re reasonable information. I mean, I, I'm not clear at all that, that although Nor Northern Ireland has its Northern Ireland Statistics uh, Authority, it, whether the um, outputs from that are any better uh, than uh, than they are for Great Britain. Um, and uh, secondly, well, yes, Scotland could have its own uh, statistics authority, which would possibly be more focused, but I would still argue that it is important to maintain close comparability with whatever kinds of data are being collected in other parts uh, of the UK and indeed uh, wider. Actually, I, I'm a little concerned about what may happen in relation to Eurostat once Brexit happens, uh, whether uh, we'll continue to collect data uh, in the same way as, as it is being collected in uh, Europe as a whole. So, for example, the Labour Force Survey in the UK is embedded as part of the European Labour Force Survey. I've, I've been using the European Labour Force Survey over the last few days, and, and they ask the same questions broadly. I'm not sure I, I to be honest, recognise um, Richard Marsh's, Marsh's characterisation of, of ONS. Um, I think it probably was true at one point, um, many many moons ago, of ONS. Um, I think one of the things that's that's happened um, more recently um, and has been accelerated by by what came out of Charlie Bean's review um, is forcing ONS institutionally to kind of change its culture a bit. Um, and so I think if you look at um, the honesty with which ONS have, for instance, said. RPI is not a useful measure um, in its current form, and, and to be honest, frankly, can't become one. Um, I think they're being pretty honest about the quality of the data. So I, I'm not sure I, I recognise um, Richard Marsh's characterisation. Um, I, mean, I, I guess in this, this thing about NISRA in Northern Ireland, um, I can see the kind of intuitive appeal of, well, let's set up a, a separate Scottish Stats Authority. Um, NISRA's not you know, fully independent. It still has it's an agency of the Northern Ireland Department of Finance. Um, so um, it's it's not um, it, it's not perhaps as, as independent as, as it might seem. Um, but also to go back to, to, to David's point and build on it a bit. One thing is we need to keep comparability. The other is we need to avoid duplication. 
Um, and if we're in this, the, the, the world now of ONS, HMRC and other um, data collection agencies UK-wide making information much more freely available, indeed making the raw data, the unprocessed um, data available to the devolved administrations, then um, th the need for the devolved administrations to have their own stats authority collecting essentially the same data um, would, wouldn't seem to be a particularly strong one to me. All right. Um, before we plug on to some questions from John Mason, do, do you think the Scottish Government should be involved in the production of data and statistical information as well as being a, a user of it from a policy point of view, just to come in on some of the last points that uh, Dr McIntyre was making? Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm in general in favour of, uh, of um, a statistical agencies being at arm's length from government. Um, and in a sense, the National Records for Scotland is, is at arm's length. Um, it's um, um, the, uh, well, the UK has a, the Statistics Authority, which oversees the, the, uh, the ONS and the impartiality of ONS. So whatever organisation, organisational arrangements are made, um, my view certainly is that is that the the organisation who is responsible for the collection and publication of data should be at arm's length uh, uh, from government. I, mean, I, I, I tend to tend to agree with David. I mean, I guess the other point, and I know this has come up in, in previous uh, meetings of the committee, and indeed we we address it in our um, our submission, is um, the issue of pre-release access, and I think it's something that. Um, post the, the Bean review, um, the ONS have, have removed um, to, to their statistics. Um, and, and we have this, this anomaly in Scotland where um, we still not only have the pre-release access, but it's actually much more generous in terms of time scale than um, it was previously elsewhere. So I think, if you like, that's, that's a, an obvious area, I think, for, for some action to take place. Thank you. And now John Mason. Uh, thank you, Convener, and firstly, my apologies uh, to yourself and the committee. I was late this morning. Uh, the other committee I'm on was meeting in Orkney last night, uh, so there are limitations about travel, but actually it's, I'm quite impressed I'm here by 10 o'clock. Anyway, uh, I mean, I realise there's been discussion already on, on gaps in data, and just to change that slightly to, to access uh, to data and statistics, I'm interested to know how you as academics uh, feel you, you get access um, I mean, clearly, if the data's not there, you're not going to get access, but do you also have the problem that sometimes you believe the data is there and you're not allowed to see it? Uh, we did have the suggestion from one witness before that when they asked ONS for uh, information, they generally got a positive response, but when they asked HMRC for information, they didn't get such a positive response. So I just wondered if you identified with that. Uh, so um, access to data is something that's close to my heart. Um, partly because, um, with a slightly different hat on, I access health data, and uh, um, the, uh, there are huge uh, qualifications around and, and um, processes to go through uh, in order to, to uh, access health data. I think it may be that, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, the. Um, HMRC is covered by different legislation uh, from ONS data. So, in general, the kinds of data that I use are accessible by bona fide economists, sorry, academics from, from around the world uh, through the data, uh, the UK data site, which probably is the best in the world for making raw data available suitably anonymized um, uh, to uh, interested, uh, interested researchers. Um, so that covers stuff like the Family Resources Survey, the Labour Force Survey. Uh, it gets more tricky when you want to access data like ASH, the wages data. So there you, you, you move up a level in terms of access. You have to go into secure access which means that you have to um, e effectively have your work checked uh, in terms of uh, whether it's, it's uh, 
being um, uh, whether it is revealing any uh, in, uh, information about individuals. And then you go to a higher level still, which I'm about to go on to later this morning, because I'm heading from here to the, the infirmary, to the bio quarter, and to access health data. And I can only do that there under the supervision of, uh, of uh, a individuals whose job it is to check that I'm using it properly. And so do you find that satisfactory? I mean, are you saying these are necessary rules or it's a bit over the top? Or? Well, <laughs> well, I would say it's, you know, it, it, it is a bit over the top, but I understand there are huge uh, sensitivities around uh, um, access to data. And in England, the, uh, in relation to the health data, um, there was an initiative which, which um, basically was disastrous, which involved the sharing of GP data um, uh, without individual consent. Individuals found out about it and uh, the whole scheme collapsed under their objections. So now it is very difficult, to much more difficult to access health data in England than is the case in Scotland. So there have to be safeguards. Maybe I think they're a bit over the top, but, but I understand why they're there. Okay. Briefly to pick up on that, I've much the same experience. I'm currently waiting for, um, for data, um, health data actually to come through of, of a similar nature. Um, and Inevitably, I think we're now developing a series of protocols which are becoming more consistent across data providers in the UK. So HMRC and ONS and other providers are now working on a more consistent uh, programme for the training of researchers. So is that in, I've undertaken this, David will have undertaken it, um, to train researchers around um, the safe use of data. So making sure that you're not trying to um, to, to take information out through which an individual may be identified, for instance. I think that's all perfectly sensible um, and proportional. Um, I, I think one of the, the, the I think that academics are getting better at accessing these data and academics are getting better at acknowledging they have to go through training to access these data. Um, and I, I agree with David that the UK data service site is great um, for, for researchers trying to access a range of surveys um, and indeed for researchers to put their own survey data up. Um, but um, I think the, the, the only roadblock in, in the data access now, frankly, is, is a resource for the analysts at the other side of, 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 the, um, of the desk, if you like, um, to get the data in a form you can access it. Um, because they've got all the data there and they'll maybe ditch off names or addresses or whatever and then put that on a, a safe haven for you to access. The, the roadblock, I think, for researchers now is more about the resources to those analysts. Um, certainly that's been by my experience in trying to access most recently the health data. So do you feel things are getting worse rather than better? Or? I, th I think they're getting a lot better on the software side, on the training side, on the... Um, the, 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 the kind of compatibility of, of requirements for researchers to apply for data, so um, the process you go through. I think what's getting worse um, is, is the analyst time at the other side of that to help um, produce those data in a form that you can access them. I think that's become a bit more difficult for some of those more sensitive um, survey type, or not survey data, administrative data. I, I, I think there is a general problem around having enough skilled people on both sides of the fence to, to, to deal with data. You know, we, we talk about we're moving into an era of big data. Well, we have to have people with the skills. These are statistical skills by and large uh, to, to deal with this. Now, the ESRC has put quite a lot of money over the years into trying to um, make so social science more quantitatively um, able. Um, that, it seems, has, has had some successes, but, but probably more needs to be done to get the, the, um, the skilled people uh, in front of the data, because the, the amount of data that's becoming available is increasing exponentially. Okay, thanks so much. And the other point I'm asking is a, on a separate issue, really, I mean, in one sense, there are gaps in, in data and statistics. I think we accept that. But 
I mean, one of the aims, presumably, is to track progress in relation to the Scottish Government's economic strategy or the national performance framework. So, you know, in one sense, if it's slightly flawed last year and it's slightly flawed this year, as long as you're comparing like with like, maybe that doesn't matter. Or is that is that too simplistic a way to look at it? I, th um, I, I think the part of the issue that I might have with the performance framework is that it's difficult to know whether government really has a handle that it can uh, t turn, which will cause one of these indicators to change for the better or indeed for the worse. So, uh, you know, you, you, you choose some measure of productivity, for example, then what is it, a, uh, how far can government policy affect the change in productivity that may or may not have occurred? It may be something that, that, that is just a function of the economic cycle that might be unwound uh, at some other point in time. So government might look to take credit for it or it might try to uh, uh, try to avoid any discussion of it if it's gone the wrong way, but it maybe it wasn't its fault in the first place. So you're saying we could we could we can tell if the productivity is improving or decreasing or or staying the same, but we can't tell why that's happened. Yeah, I th I, th I mean I, I I think it's very difficult. That, I mean if if we knew exactly what the the levers for for productivity were, we'd be we'd be turning them as hard as we could. Um, but um, there's a, you know, the, the, there are lots of debates and discussions. Andy Haldane at the Bank of England has, has been looking at this recently. There, there, there are no clear sets of interventions that people know of that will immediately result. And I, I say immediately because you may have interventions that only have an effect after five years or ten years. Um, so... Uh, uh, yes, th I guess that's my uh, my concern that that uh, we can't be sure what the causal linkage is. Okay. I, if I just add slightly to that um, and pick up on something which um, you you weren't here when when I was talking about one of the things that I think we've collectively been a bit concerned about is um, the distinction between what everyone focuses on, which are the very high level um, aggregate figures. Um, whether it be GDP, whether it be productivity, whether it be employment, unemployment. Um, and these are used as indicators of progress, um, which if you look at the longer term um, and you smooth out some of these issues around the business cycle, they may well be. Um, actually, I think the much more interesting, much more important thing is um, if we don't know what might work, or if, or if we don't know what does work, we might have some ideas of what might work and thus actually within each of these policy initiatives or, um, or, or, or pilots or whatever, we embed proper robust program and policy evaluation so as that we can get to the other side of it and say, well, here's the impacts of this. Now, you know, then aggregating that up to an economy-wide impact might become a bit difficult, but at least we can say we've tried this intervention, we've evaluated it robustly, and we found that it's had this impact. Um, so this works rather than um, we've done this initiative and GDP has gone up or down or productivity has gone up or down, when the causal link between that is, is intangible. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. And um, Jackie Bailey. Uh, Stuart answered this in part, but I wonder whether I could put the same question to Professor Bell. Um, Pre-release access to statistics still applies to ministers in Scotland, but as we've heard, ONS and the Bank of England have ceased that practice. Should we follow them? Um, I think that, uh, in general, um, my view, and this is not, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm tricking, um, well, I, I don't think that um, politicians should necessarily uh, be in a better position than others when it comes to um, the release of data. Thank you very much. Um, can I move to public finance now, something I know you've taken an interest in? Um, given our new powers, do you think we have enough information on the overall financial position of the public sector? In other words, do you see a value in, in whole government accounts, in assets and liabilities um, being set out quite clearly? 
I think there's a strong case for that, and there's a case that Audit Scotland have made. Um, clearly, you, you in, you, there is a, a debate around contingent liabilities, like you know, how do you value pensions, pension liabilities in the future, and, you, and, and these may change a lot with a small change in the interest rate. Um, so you have to treat them with some uh, caution. But nevertheless, if you're looking to the medium to long term uh, financial position of the government, there are some things which uh, look to be um, uh, very high probability associated with the ageing population, for example, uh, that um, maybe we need to be a bit more radical in our thinking if we are really to prepare for 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 the changes that we or the changes in liabilities that we know are likely to come down the line. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, we make much the same point in our submission, and indeed I think it builds on um, some of the, some of the, the concerns around ageing. Build on our, you know, our, our budget report a few weeks ago, which is just emphasising this point. Um, now, I, I think there's you know if you look at the UK whole of government accounts, all the Scottish government bodies and. Um, non-departmental bodies and everything else are in there. So um, the information's there. It's just a question of, of how we perhaps um, reparcel the information that's already there. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. And now a question from Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, we've heard evidence uh, last week, but in particular, about the de definition around inclusive growth. And um, Professor Bell, you mentioned inequality. Do we have the ability to measure inclusive growth and inequality of the data that we currently have, or any tweaks that could be made to the currently available data. For example, we've had issues, we've had some, some of our investigations around the gender pay gap, and data's out there, but it's not disaggregated into gender. Um, that's just one example that's come up recently. So, um, most of the inequality lit literature uses one of two sources for um, measuring inequality. One is the Family Resources Survey, which is paid for by the DWP, and the other is Understanding Society, which is paid for by the ESRC, by the Research Councils. Um, is there enough in Well, again, you know, for granularity, um, you might, you would actually get quite a good guess at the um, differences by gender from these two surveys within Scotland. You wouldn't get a guess at all of uh, differences between different ethnicities, because the Scottish, although there's an, actually the <coughs> Understanding Society has a boost for for. Um, non-white population is not going to be enough to to uh, give you a guess at that for for uh, uh, Scot Scotland. Uh, so the other thing is, in terms of inequalities, uh, we do know a lot about income inequalities. We know not very much about wealth inequalities. That's something I'm trying to address with my ageing survey. Uh, so the the the. Um, main source for that in England is the English Longitudinal Survey of Ageing or the Wealth and Assets Survey. Uh, but in Scotland, uh, again, Wealth and Assets Survey, is the, 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 the sample size isn't that big in Scotland. And obviously, the English Longitudinal Survey of, of Ageing doesn't cover Scotland. Um, and I think over time, we're likely to see more emphasis on wealth inequalities than, than has been the, the case recently, where most of the um, uh, kind of information research that hits the public is around um, poverty levels and inequality levels as measured using income, not wealth. I, I agree with David. Um, I, I think the there's, there's a range of data there. Um, I think, as always with these surveys, the difficulty once you start trying to get down to um, particular groups, and you know, I, yeah, Oxfam did um, something um, a few years ago um, which wanted to focus in in particular on less heard groups, 
Um, I think if you if you start going down that line within the existing survey data, it becomes quite difficult because the number of these, uh, almost by definition of the less heard groups, um, they're less likely to be, be sampled. And if they are, um, they're going to be in the distinct minority among that sample. So um, I think you do run into data problems when you start drilling down a lot into um, uh, different you know, income by characteristics of mm -hmm. individuals. So we're going to be getting access to this administrative data from the HMRC, but none of that's really going to address looking at, uh, we won't be able to analyse that in terms of inclusive growth or inequality. Well, you see, administrative data are limited compared with survey data because they're collected for administrative purposes. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, they don't necessarily have all the characteristics of the individuals that you might want to do the kinds of analysis by some kind of subgroup uh, uh, that you want. So, for example, the HMRC data um, will have gender, certainly, it will, but it may not have ethnicity uh, uh, because you don't have to fill in your ethnicity yeah. when you do your, uh, your, your self-assessment form. I think the other thing is, um, and this has been talked about for a while, and I think it is finally happening, is taking some of these bigger administrative data sets and linking them together. So you link together DWP with HMRC, um, and you know certainly with, with colleagues we've been we've been talking about this um, because if somebody disappears from the HMRC data, they may well show up in the DWP data, and if they leave the DWP data, they may well show up in the HMRC data. So actually linking these together. Um, gives you a better understanding of um, of people's kind of transition um, through time, but as David said, um, you need the, the administrative data collected for that administrative purpose and, and, and may well not capture the characteristics that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, we, we, for example, the ben the benefits of, of linkage, uh, our survey is an hour and a half survey of people. So we, we, we collect loads of information on their characteristics so we can assign them to some subgroup. We then link that to their health data. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can see what kinds of people are uh, frequently in hospital, often go to the dentist, um, have care packages, these, these kinds of things. So you, the, this is the great benefit of linkage of a survey to administrative data. You can put all the characteristics that you might want to in relation to assessing inclusive growth together with the admin data, mm -hmm. which, which, which uh, 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 enhances the power of the survey hugely. So presumably, if you wanted to analyse in-work poverty in Scotland, it would be a case of linking all the available data together and making an analysis of that. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, if you were able, for example, t to link um, the Labour Force survey to DWP records, uh, you would be able to look at somebody's benefit history and uh, the Labour Force survey, uh, similar to our survey, asks a lot of individual char characteristics uh, about people's... Um, health and uh, uh, disabilities, these kinds of things. So you, you can put them all, once you've got that linkage made, you can, it's a very, very powerful data resource. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of follow-ups from Dean Lockhart. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Just with inclusive growth, um, it sounds like there's some useful data out there to, to benchmark it, but in terms of what we're trying to measure, is there an internationally recognised definition of what inclusive growth is? I'm not. I'm, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar. I'm not aware of one. Um, no. I mean, I, I could think of a combination of any some combined measure involving both inequality and and GDP per capita growth, uh, but I don't think there's an accepted international measure. And, and insofar as you're aware, is there a definition in Scotland or that the Scottish government uses to? measure changes and progress against the target of inclusive growth? I'm not sure of one either. I'm not sure. Just a similar question, but this time on innovation, another of the four I's, um, obviously a key driver of productivity innovation, um, and clearly something everyone's focused on, but again, similar question, is there a recognised way of measuring 
innovation and progress in innovation? I think um, work is being done on that. I would think of uh, John Van Rienen, um, uh, who's at MIT, ex of LIC, who's done some uh, work recently uh, on uh, on the determinants of um, uh, a sorry on innovation and indeed on 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 another topic which is mentioned very rarely, which is management quality. Um, but. I would say these are exploratory. Uh, uh, res that this is exploratory research at the moment, and uh, may take some time before it emerges in terms of a national statistic that measures innovation. Yeah, I, I think the the ONS have a have a paper out in July, um, which was trying to um, scope out the possibility of. Um, Pulling, uh, dis distinguishing in total productivity between improvements in labour productivity, capital productivity, and um, you know, uh, multi-factor productivity. Um, and, and you know, one of John Van Rienen's things is that well, we can measure labour productivity to some extent. We can measure capital productivity. Um, then there's another component of productivity. What is that? Mm. And how do we impact on that? And Van Rienen stuff, um, as David said, is, is looking at management practice as another form of technology, um, and so trying to help us better understand. And then, you know, we can we can estimate um, that that um, increase in productivity not due to um, improvements in labour productivity or capital productivity, um, that residual um, solar residual, um, but then understand what's within that. Um, then focuses, I guess, more on, on some of these um, kind of firm level studies where they're trying to understand why some firms are more productive than others. Thank you. Just one final question, if I may. We read about the OECD having um, top quartile, second quartile mm -hmm. of uh, innovation and productivity. How does the OECD then measure a, a, a country's innovation levels? Is there some sort of benchmark they, they look at? I'm not familiar with the OECD's oh. measure, but what I would say is that the OECD, from experience, are very good at producing um, methodology papers alongside that. So okay. um, something I'm happy to look at um, if it would um, benefit the committee um, to, to do that. Um, but I, I would expect that they will have made that information available. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. We're running short of time, but a quick question from Gil Patterson. Yeah. Uh, say, how do you see the Digital Economy Act 2017 improving the quality and timeliness of economic statistics in the UK, and what can Scotland learn from that? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll t this goes back to exactly what I said before. The Digital Economy Act, I think, <coughs> cements in place now data access and makes it absolutely clear to HMRC that legally they can share a lot of their administrative data with other government departments and also um, the devolved administration. So um, in terms of, um, of data access, I think the Digital Economy Act moves us well ahead. Um, there's always going to be an issue of timeliness. David touched on this earlier around the timeliness with which actually people have to report information to, say, HMRC. That imposes um, a, a kind of necessary time lag in the data. Um, but I think through the Digital Economy Act, we are going to see much better, much fuller, and much more timely access to data for both other government departments but also the model administrations. Okay. Can I just quote you from the Royal Statistical uh, Society? And they point out that the DEA will not provide devolved administrations with direct access uh, to these data sources, but they should be able to access them through the ONS. Don't you think there should be a bit more? Do you think there's a weakness in that? A bit back to where we are at the present time, rather than the d devolved administration having the right to, to so change it to shall rather than should? Or do you, with your own experience, does it make any difference? I'm not sure this isn't um, something of a difference, with, uh, a distinction without much of a difference um, with respect to um, what the RSS were mentioning. I think this is getting at the point that HMRC will prepare the data. The data will be cleaned. The data will be... Um, you know, assessed as being a complete data set, 
and then it will be put on to, um, say, the uh, HMRC's microdata lab that will give access to government departments or the ONS's VML, and that's a data product that's there, um, versus, for instance, the Scottish Government being able to directly look up anyone's tax records. I think that's probably the distinction that, okay. but I, I can't speak for the RSS, but I suspect that's the distinction that's been made there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other questions from committee members, um, I'd like to thank our two witnesses, and uh, I'll suspend the meeting to move to our next session. Thank you.